I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episode of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we learned all about the second letter of Peter the Apostle. In this letter, he is not trying to encourage Christians to have hope in the face of suffering, but rather he is trying to help them to be true and faithful in the face of falsehood. We also learned that in order to be faithful and to remain true to God, the first thing we needed to do is to learn what God has promised by acquainting ourselves with the Scriptures. Secondly, we should work at understanding them and applying them in our lives. To help his readers, Peter used a Greek literary device called the Sorites, a staircase of successive statements that build on top of each other in the same way believers should grow in faith and become mature. In the second chapter, Peter warns his readers about false teachers that have arisen in the church. He gives a very clear description of the characteristics of these false teachers. Firstly, they will be presumptuous and arrogant. 2 Peter 2 verses 10 to 11 says that these false teachers are bold and arrogant and show no respect for the glorious beings above. Instead, they insult them. Even the angels, who are so much stronger and mightier than these false teachers, do not accuse them with insults in the presence of the Lord. These false teachers will be very eloquent, using impressive words about life and death and salvation, but they will really be ignorant. They will not know what they are talking about. Secondly, they will be ignorant like animals. Peter in verse 12 describes them as irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed, reviled in manners of which they are ignorant. Thirdly, they will be shameless. They will encourage licentiousness and sexual misconduct. The Greek phrase used here literally describes a man who sees sex every time he looks at a woman. They will openly urge people to indulge their lust freely and shamelessly. Verse 13 says, They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast on you. Fourthly, they will be greedy. 2 Peter 2 verses 14 says, They have hearts trained in greed. These false teachers have trained their hearts for greed to the point that Peter calls them experts. That is, they have developed the ability to get what they covered by any means necessary. For the sake of money, they will teach almost anything they think people want to hear. Finally, they will be pretentious. Verse 18 says, They boast with words that mean nothing. They lead people into the trap of sin. They find people who have just escaped from a wrong way of life and lead them back into sin. They do this by using the evil things people want to do in their human weakness. This section of Peter's letter is clearly written with passion. He continues to condemn the false teachers at work in the early church. Jesus himself had given Peter the mission to tend the sheep of God. At times, a shepherd's job includes driving away wild predators, which requires some ferocity, and Peter shows this by defending his flock from these attacking wolves. Peter's final statement in verse 19 can provide us a lot of insight into the world we currently live in. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. The world typically claims that freedom means doing whatever you want, whenever you want, and however you want. These false teachers in the early church promised this kind of freedom. But they promise a freedom they don't have. Instead of being free to indulge in their sexual passions, they simply cannot do anything else. They are, in fact, slaves, mastered by their own sinful desires. This is one of the most poorly understood but powerful truths about sin. What Satan tells you is an expression of freedom is actually the very thing that enslaves you. Peter finishes this part of the letter with some of the most sobering words in Scripture. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, 
the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. God is as concerned about sin and believers as he is about sin and those who are outside the church. Indeed, the person who falls away will be punished more severely than the one who never repented. This is a stark and solemn warning for those who believe they are safe because they have trusted in Christ, even though their life points to a lie surrounding their profession of faith. They become victims of their own delusions. The final chapter in 2 Peter focuses on the believer's hope for the future and dismantles the arguments of the false teachers. Peter's purpose is urging Christians not to waver in their beliefs, but to continue to live out what they know to be true. He starts by reminding them of his first letter and what God has promised. In chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 he says, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Peter deals with the reasoning behind these false teachers' denial of the final judgment. One specific claim that was being made by false teachers is that Christ would never return. This claim also rejects the idea that God would judge the sins of humanity. These deceivers mocked those ideas by asking, Where is the coming of Jesus? According to their challenge, it had been too long, and the world seemed to be going along as it always has. They thought nothing would change. This is a suggestion that God would never alter the course of the natural physical world to enforce his will. The return of Jesus Christ has always been the target of false teachers and scoffers and mockers throughout the centuries even before Peter wrote this letter. But just for a moment, let us suppose that they are right, and Jesus was not coming back, and suppose that Jesus never actually rose from the dead. Consider the implications. Wrong would never be made right. All the injustice in this world would never be replaced by fairness and equality. Suffering would never be rewarded, and the sin's curse on this world would never be removed. The longing for a better world would be an illusion. The question we would have to ask is, could we hold such a belief? How could we trust and hope and believe if there was no real resolution and nothing would ever be made right? I think that if you are a true believer, then deep in your heart you know this presumption to be completely false. Let us return to verse 3, because this exposes the real reason why this doctrine of there be no second coming. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. These false teachers deny the coming of Christ because they want to follow their own lusts. In other words, their doctrine of there be no second coming is because they don't want any accountability. They do not want to ever have to answer to God for the life that they live. And if you want to live an immoral, lust-controlled life and do not want any accountability, the best way you can eliminate judgment is to eliminate the second coming of Christ. Peter responds by showing how short-sighted this thinking is. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 5 to 7, For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter's argument is simple and logical. God made the world so that he can alter it whenever he desires. The laws and the patterns of the universe are his to override as he chooses. These false teachers are also forgetting about Noah's flood. During that event, God brought judgment on the earth for the sins of humanity. This was a supernatural act through physical means, 
and an intervention by God in the natural world. For that judgment, God used water. For the last judgment, God will use fire. Peter also reminds believers that God is not bound by time as we mere humans are. For him, what people perceive as a day and a thousand years are the same to him. Just because we don't understand or agree with God's timing doesn't mean he is not acting or that he will not act at all. Look what 2 Peter 3 verses 8 to 9 says. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God's delay should always be seen as evidence of his patience and mercy. His desire is that as many people as possible would come to repentance and to place their trust in Christ. The additional time that he has granted is an opportunity for more to be saved. From verse 10, Peter uses the prophetic poetry of Isaiah and Zephaniah who describe the day of God's justice as a consuming fire. You can find that in Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 7 to 18 and Isaiah 13 verses 6 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Peter says the heavens will pass away, and the elements will melt by fire. Peter uses the Greek word, Stokaya, which means the elements out of which all things are formed, or the heavenly bodies. These are the basic elements that make up the chemical composition of the universe. Even further down, there is the atomic structure of the universe, the atoms, the neutrons, the protons, the electrons. They're going to be dissolved, to be literally destroyed. We all have grown used to the everyday cycle of this universe the daily rising and setting of the sun, the passing of the seasons, the fixed positions of the stars that sailors navigate by, the cycles of the moon and the planets. Everything points to a stable universe where nothing ever happens out of the ordinary and where God does not intervene or interfere. But, says Peter, we would be wrong. We have been wrong in the past. We would be wrong in the future. This is not a stable universe. The flood is the record of the past. Scripture has recorded it, and it is also verified in the geological record of this earth. The record of the flood points forward to the day in the future when the world will be destroyed again. Not this time by water, but by fire. Look back at 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 5 to 7 again. The heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now go back to verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There are two points that we have to remember about this. Firstly, God's dealing with mankind in the past has proved what the future will hold, and the record of the flood is the guarantee that God is going to move as he said he would in the future. The world that now exists is kept together by the same word as the world that existed before the flood. The one thing that keeps life operating at all is the word of God and the authority of God. Therefore, all God needs to do is to alter things in our physical universe and everything will begin to fall apart. God does not look on time like we do. Remember, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. What seems to drag on endlessly for us is but a few moments for him. 
Secondly, God has a reason in delaying. And this should be a great comfort and relief to us, because once God begins judgment, everyone will be included. He delays his hand of judgment so that we all will have a chance to think over what our life is all about. Many believers think that repentance simply means to change one's mind and nothing more. However, this is an incomplete definition of repentance. Repentance is actually much more than just a change of mind. It means to think again, to look at the facts as we are confronted with them, and then to act on that basis. God withholds his hand in order that men might have a chance to think things over and to change their minds. I find this so encouraging. Aren't you glad God waited graciously for you? Why does God put up with the scoffing of men? Why does he tolerate the violence, the cruelty and the injustice, the immorality and the perverse things that go on in our world? Why does he do this? Because he is a loving God, and he is not willing that any should perish. He waits and delays in order that men might have a chance to think things through and to consider where it is all going and to change their minds and agree with God that they need a saviour. Peter then asks an important question in 2 Peter 3 verses 11 to 12. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Because the prophecies of Scripture are true, and the false teachers are wrong, how should Christians live right now? Instead of indulging in sin without fear of consequences, As the false teachers suggest, Peter says we should live holy and godly lives. We should live as people looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. That means we should keep working to set aside our sin and to live in peace with God. But how do we hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we bring what mankind has hoped and dreamed for for centuries? A world of peace, a world of plenty, a world of blessing and joy, an unlimited opportunity for all? How do you bring about a world like that? During every election year, every politician promises many things. In November this year in the USA, the Republicans and the Democrats will be making promises. In 2021, my country, South Africa, will have its politicians also making promises. We do not know which politician to believe, because, frankly, deep down, We know that they are all liars and frauds. None of them can produce what they promise, because they are not addressing the heart of the problem, man's sin. But Peter says that we, the children of God, have the ability to hasten the coming of this day. How can we do this? There are three things found in scripture that all believers can do. Firstly, prayer. Matthew 6 verses 10 says, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, and this is a prayer for hastening the day of God. Secondly, witnessing. Matthew 24 verses 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. As we share our faith in genuine love and compassion, Meeting the needs of others and sharing with them the hope that we have, we are hastening the coming of the day of God. Thirdly, obedience. We have already read 2 Peter 3 verses 11 to 12 that says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? What God is looking for is men and women who will be obedient who will be his. The only freedom that mankind has at all is choosing whom they will serve, either God or Satan. And the freedom that comes from serving Satan is only temporary, the appearance of freedom that soon changes to slavery. However, the freedom that Jesus Christ provides is a growing freedom that touches every part of our lives. We just need to stop briefly and understand what Peter is saying in 2 Peter 3 verses 14, which says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, 
be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace. Peter writes that we should live in a state of preparation. We should be motivated by the idea of how Christ will find us when he returns. This will require work, but we must be very careful here. Peter has already made that clear. God has already made his people holy through faith in Christ. He counts our sins as fully paid for by the blood and death of Jesus. We have been credited with Jesus' righteousness and all believers have peace with God in Christ. Eternal salvation is not something we can work for or earn. Peter reminds us of what he said at the beginning of his letter. In God's power, we should work to live up to those things that are true of us in Christ. We should work to root out the sin of our lifestyles and grow in our relationship with God. We don't do this to earn our place in God's family. We do it because we already have one. Finally, in verses 15 and 16, Peter recognizes that Paul has said the same thing in Romans 2 verses 4 and acknowledges that Paul's wisdom comes from God and calls Paul a beloved brother. This should already be clear from the careful reading of the New Testament that the inspired writings of each of these books establish and support each other. Peter, Paul, and the other writers of the New Testament all wrote the words of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Verses 17 and 18 are the conclusion of Peter's letter and provide a clean, concise summary of the whole letter. Peter urges his readers to grow in two areas, the grace of Jesus and their knowledge of him. To grow in grace does not mean to get more and more of God's grace. Grace by definition is unearned and unworked for. By his grace, God has forgiven our sins and given us full rights as his children in Christ. We can't get more of that, but living under the grace of Jesus provides us a huge opportunity to grow spiritually stronger and deeper, and getting to know Jesus better and better in our relationship with him. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless men and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter describes Jesus as both our Lord and our Savior. To really know him, we must continue to grow in our understanding of what it means to live in relationship to Jesus as Lord and as Savior. And we, like Peter, will reach the single conclusion. Jesus is the one who deserves the glory, both now and forever. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 11. Mm-hmm.